welcome back to episode 16 and today we're going to look into double bass recording. Now most people can identify double bass uh, but in actual fact the thing that we see on stages with big bands, jazz bands, rockabilly, uh, old-fashioned rock and roll, those double basses are actually only three-quarter size basses. Uh, if you see the ones they use in an orchestra they're actually even bigger. But we're not going to concern ourselves with recording those today because in most cases an orchestral double bass is recorded from a distance anyway. So we're concerned with how to record a typical three-quarter size double bass. Now quite a lot of the ones that are used on stage, especially in rock and roll and the rockabilly, will almost certainly have a pickup of some kind on. Uh, very often uh, a very strange looking pickup little black dot that actually is glued to the bridge and you can plug a quarter inch jack into it, stick it into a typical bass amp and away you go. Um, I've set up this double bass we're going to use today with uh, a similar pickup and we'll record it alongside the microphones that we're going to use. One of the things with a double bass is that it is not in any shape or form a stereo instrument but like a guitar it has different tones coming from different parts of the body. So there's a rather dark, uh, warm sound that comes from near the, the F holes that you see on the front of a double bass. But the actual body itself plays a huge part in forming that characteristic sound that the instrument's got. So there's huge scope for putting different microphones on them and also putting those microphones in different places. Oddly, it's not that common to see people record a double bass with two microphones in the same way that you would perhaps with a guitar. It tends to be just one. It may be that the range of frequencies from low to high is just a little bit more condensed. But in general, you get a pretty good sound with a, a one microphone technique used on a double bass. Now the odd thing, of course, is that with the double bass being a predominantly bass instrument, uh, dynamic microphones are fine, condensers are fine, and it could be argued that you really don't want that very top end because most bass players actually don't like that bit. It could be argued that you don't actually need all that HF response because the predominant tone of a double bass is very much down the bottom. And unlike an electric guitar, its job really is to stay down the bottom. Now, you will get jazz players who will do some twiddly bits higher up, and of course that's perfectly fine. But when they do that, they also tend to play very close to where the microphone is, which does tend to compensate to a certain degree. So as the HF goes up, you're also getting a little bit down nearer the microphone, so dynamic mic gets more of it anyway. Now, one of the big snags with a double bass is that when you buy them, uh, you tend to have them set up for one of three different types of playing. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't play a double bass that's been set up for one on a different one, but they've got different needs. So, if you're going to play uh, classical music with a bow, you want to be able to sort of play that very loud, strident sort of stuff, which tends to give you a very high action so that you can really dig in and make it very, very loud. Uh, if you're playing jazz, then almost certainly you won't be needing to play that loud. And also, some of the stuff is quite intricate, and so a lower action is preferred by most players if they're going to predominate and play jazz. For people like me, uh, I'm more likely to be playing quiet jazz than I am anything else, so that's the sort of action I've got. If you're into rockabilly, one of the particular needs of that style of playing is that you slap the strings. Now, unlike the sort of slap technique that you see on an electric bass, slapping a double bass actually means you hit the strings with the flat of your hand and you whack them into the fingerboard and that produces a really strong click. So if you're going to record someone who plays rockabilly or any form of the slap bass techniques, then you need to pick up that HF stuff. So the mic position might need to be altered very slightly to cope with that. I can't play that. Um, I can do it a little bit, but I'm just not quick enough. Uh, there's a very 
crafty slapping action that you have to master and being honest I, I haven't um, so although I know how to do it I've not actually been able to actually get on with that particular technique at all so we've got three different sorts of action that you'll come across on a double bass the very low action that's needed for slapping uh, a medium one which is fine for jazz uh, and really most styles of playing and then of course a slightly higher one for a classical player who needs to have plenty of volume and really dig in with a bow so that's the three choices in instrument we also have huge choices in the quality of the instrument now by quality i don't necessarily mean that the way it's constructed but the materials it's constructed from so a typical cheap double bass and when i say cheap that's a relative term because there's no such thing as a really cheap one uh, they're big instruments there's a lot of wood in them and they're also incredibly heavy so even to get one delivered can cost you a fortune but the typical wood in a cheap double bass is plywood now there's nothing wrong with plywood i mean plywood has been used uh, for uh, applications where you need high structural integrity for years uh, a thin piece of plywood is an incredibly strong material to make an instrument from so a plywood base can be physically quite strong where it falls down a little bit is in tone uh, if you have a, uh, an acoustic spanish style guitar and you tap the body you can hear a sort of resonance on it that a cheap spanish style guitar doesn't seem to have it's the same thing the materials themselves contribute an awful lot to the tone of an instrument so a plywood double bass can be heat formed into having the right curves but the actual material itself doesn't really contribute much positively to the sound of the instrument the other construction of course is then a carved one uh, a bit like uh, a les paul electric where the actual curve has been made by chiseling away some of the material now that's again uh, a completely different approach to making a double bass and if you have a, a real wood double bass the price escalates dramatically now because they're a, a fretless instrument uh, all you really need for the fingerboard is something that's hard and not going to wear and uh, like most fretless electric bases it's not that complicated anymore to make that type of construction most double basses are four strings EAD and G um, no real difference there the only slightly strange thing about a double bass is that the actual way that the fingers are on the neck is that it's a bit more of a stretch and luckily I've got quite big hands and I can manage that people with small small hands really struggle um, when they struggle it means they have to move their whole hand further than a player with big hands so sometimes that can introduce uh, noises and other sorts of creaks and groans coming from the person when they're trying to struggle to actually play the wider space notes now there is noise that comes from the player's left hand in the same way that you get with uh, an acoustic guitar uh, i have to be very careful because i'm a bit of a sloppy player and i can actually make quite a lot of percussive noises with my left hand it suits some of the styles that i play and i've got into the quite bad habit of finding it difficult to not make these percussive noises when I go from certain notes to certain notes now if that's a good thing then you want to record it and if it's a bad thing you need to do your hardest to not record it so again that makes another change to where you're going to want to put your microphone there's no real rules in terms of choosing a mic SDCs large diaphragm condensers they all work and produce a slightly different result depending a little bit on what you're going to do and of course because it's a big instrument the room that you play it in matters quite a lot the usual trick that you use on uh, acoustic guitars or pianos of putting a bit of reverb on to soften up the sound of a slightly iffy room 
is always a bit more of a problem on a double bass. Double basses don't respond particularly well to reverb uh, because of the range of notes that they're producing, especially down the bottom with all the clicks and bangs that double basses have. Putting reverb on it becomes a little bit obvious. So it's uh, better to record it in a way that needs less treatment than it is to record it very, very dry and then try and add it on afterwards. So for the test today, we're going to use a range of microphones and I'm going to record in a number of different positions with each microphone. I'll use some of the microphones that we've used before uh, and I'll possibly use a few slightly unusual ones. So you get a bit of a, a better idea of the sort of differences changing in microphones and changing positions will actually do. Um, I'll try and repeat the pieces that I'm going to play. So uh, I'll find things that I can repeat over and over again reasonably accurately so you can compare them. What I've also done to make it a bit more equal between the microphone choices is put the double bass on a stand. So instead of me holding it, the double bass will stay in exactly the same position and I'll walk behind the stand and I'll play it from there. So the double bass to the microphone won't change. There's no possibility in this test of me twisting it round, moving it further away, changing the angle. All things that with a double bass happen with a microphone. It should be a fairly consistent test. I place the microphone, play the double bass, you hear the difference and make your own mind up.
Well, what did you think? Uh, any particular preferences? I'm sure some of you will absolutely hate some of the microphones and love the others. Uh, and some of the differences in tone when we move the mic uh, were perhaps not what you expected, or m maybe they were exactly what you expected. If you've got any comments, leave them below, because it'd be interesting to read what you think compared with what you heard. The one thing I did discover, this is a particularly useless uh, video to watch on anything with other than decent bass response. Uh, I did try it on my MacBook and the MacBook gave me a bit of a shock because it doesn't seem to actually have any bass. It goes down to a certain note and then stops. So uh, headphones or decent full range speakers are absolutely essential for this one. If you listen to it on a MacBook it ain't gonna work. Anyway that's the video for today folks. I hope it was useful. If it was Click the subscribe button, do the bell ringing stuff, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye.